What's up everybody, it's the river here, and today I'm going to take you through my attempt at a Pokemon Shining Pearl Hardcore Nuzlocke using only water types. For those of you who might not know, Hardcore Nuzlocke's include additional rules to make the game more challenging. I'll leave a full list of the rules in the description below, but the major points are up on screen. Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl are finally out, and I'm really excited to dive back into the Sinnoh region. The original Gen 4 games came out at the height of my initial infatuation with the Pokemon series, and hold a special place in my memory, even despite some of the annoying environmental features like deep snow and fog. I thought this would be a great opportunity to try my first monotype run, and I decided on water types. And I don't know if you guys are aware, but it looks like almost everyone decided to do a water-only Nuzlocke as well. Personally, I blame Empoleon, water and steel is a really cool typing that you don't see every day. In general though, water is usually one of, if not the most abundant type of Pokemon that appear in each game, so it feels like a good starting point for a beginner-friendly monotype run. The Sinnoh remakes have the following water types available. A pretty generous amount, and a bunch of dual typings to deal with the only two weaknesses for water types, grass and electric. That being said, grass types are incredibly common, especially in the early game, and as I came to realize very quickly, the most recent generations of Pokemon have updated a lot of wild Pokemon and trainers to include diverse movesets that proved to be a bit difficult to maneuver around in a monotype water challenge. The game kicks off with Piplup as my starter, and after taking out the Starly that assaulted us, I made it back to Professor Rowan who gives me a Pokedex and the opportunity to start the very obvious naming scheme for my team of water type Pokemon. I quickly find myself a Bidoof, who will eventually be used as a Water-type Bibarel, but for now is just moral support. I didn't expect to run into anything interesting before the first rival battle, but while at the trainer school, I fight these two kids who both have Abra with Charge Beam. Thankfully I do make it through the battles, but this was just my first taste of the updated trainer movesets. I'm pretty sure all the Abra just had hidden power in the original games. I get the old rod after talking to this fisherman, so I can get myself a Magikarp pretty early on. It'll be pretty useless until its evolution into one of the most powerful Pokemon in the game, but at least it's a water type that can be sent into battle in case of emergencies. It's time for the first rival battle with Barry, and he doesn't seem like much of a threat because he won't be using his super effective moves against my starter, but I've still only got one useful Pokemon for battling. I take out his Starly with two water guns while getting hit with a tackle and then a growl, his Turtwig is out next, and neither of us can do much damage to each other. I even tried swapping in and out of Tigris the Magikarp to reset the attack drop from Growl, but Turtwig used Withdraw, so it was kind of pointless. Long story short, we whittle each other down, but I make it out of the battle with Nile at 1 HP. Not even close. I make it over to the first gym to fight Rourke, but he only uses Rock types, so I'm not really worried. I expected his Geodude to set up with Stealth Rocks or Defense Curl, but he goes straight into Rollout as I use Workup. I decide to go on the offensive, and Water Gun takes out Geodude and then Onyx with only some light stalling from Sturdy. Granados is out last, and it is pretty powerful, but thankfully the Headbutt does not get the flinch chance, and the plus one Water Gun takes it out in one shot. I thought I'd need another workup for the one shot, but I'm not complaining because the training wheels are now off, and I've got to find a way to prepare for Gardenia and her gym full of grass types. I've still got some time before we need to face off, so I catch a Psyduck in the Orberg Gate, and after taking out some Team Galactic runs with Dawn, Nile evolves into a Printlub. I also run into this kid who questions my decision to use only one type of Pokemon, and like, yeah, I know, man, I'm working on it. I find a Buizel outside the Valley Windworks, and I'm a bit anxious about the infamous fight with Mars, but it's not as much of an issue as I feared it would be. I lead Nile into her Zubat, and I set up a workup as she U-turns into Perugly. I know she'll use Fake Out, so it doesn't matter what I use next, but on the next turn I use Pluck to steal her Orinberry after taking damage from Scratch. She keeps using Scratch, but I still have my own Orin Berry for recovery, and after two water guns, the fat cat goes down. Zubat is back out, and after doing a lot of damage with water gun, I swap into Ganges the Psyduck to avoid dealing with the confusion, and my own confusion takes out Mars. 
This opens up my next encounter as I find a Shellos on Route 205, who I nickname Yang Si. Yang Shi? Yang Si? Uh, if anyone knows how to pronounce that, let me know, but I'll be calling her Yang for the rest of the run. Shortly after, I actually get my next Pokemon as Danube evolves into a Bibero, and I've got myself a full team of six. Eterna Forest is the next area, and I thought it would be a nice leisurely stroll with Cheryl as she heals up my Pokemon after each fight, but then I ran into these two psychics with Abra. And as I was reminiscing about the other Abra trainers who had Charge Beam, they both hit me with super effective Energy Ball. I was able to take out one of the Abra on turn 1 with Bubble Beam, but then I have to switch through my team until the other Abra used Energy Ball on Chansey and got confused by a Sweet Kiss, giving me the opportunity to stay in and take it out. The rest of the forest is the cakewalk I expected it to be, but I stayed on my toes for the rest of the run, and I can't wait for some evolutions and dual typings to help me deal with these pesky Abra trainers. In Eterna City, I get access to the Grand Underground, which has been revamped to include some wild area rooms for potential encounters. I've already caught all available Pokémon for this run, but I've got some ideas on how to use the Underground for future challenges. While wandering the city, I also run into Cynthia, in all her chibi glory, and I refuse to let her appearance fool me because I know her team is going to be more terrifying than ever. It's finally time for the gym I've been dreading, but while battling the gym trainers, I get my savior in the form of Tigress's evolution into Gyarados, and I'm pretty sure it was around this time that I finally realized I misspelled his name. Besides being an all-around beast, the dual flying typing means he won't be as vulnerable to grass type moves, even if I can't get early Ice Fang in this generation. I begin the fight with Gardenia, and I lead Danube, who I've taught the Pluck TM. I use Pluck to take out the Cherubi before she can use Grass Knot, and I do the same to Turtwig, but a single Pluck is not enough to take him out. He then sets up Reflect, which I'm really not happy about, so I try to stall a bit by setting up two simple boosted defense scrolls. Pluck then takes out Turtwig, and out comes her fully evolved Roserade. I've already resolved to sack Danube for the switch, so she gets taken out by Grass Knot as the opposing Reflect ends. Tigress is out next, and the Intimidate should help into the Petal Blizzard, but Grass Knot is still gonna hurt. I use Waterfall for some chip damage, but it's already time to switch out Tigress. My sacrificial switch is Amazon the Buizel, and she also goes down to a single Grass Knot. Nile comes out, and Roserade misses a Stun Spore as I use Pluck to steal her Citrus Berry. Gardenia uses a Super Potion as Nile hits another Pluck, and she lands the Stun Spore on the next turn, but my Cherry Berry was still intact, so Nile shakes it off and takes out Roserade with one more Pluck. A rough battle to be sure, but I'll take two deaths over having my whole team swept by Roserade. There's some galactic shenanigans as I go to rescue the bike salesman, but Tigris single-handedly destroys Jupiter with a bunch of waterfalls. Beast. I get a bike for my troubles, and I'm the river guy, I've gotta get the blue one. While traveling through Mount Coronet, I run into Cyrus for the first time, and gotta say I don't think he benefited from the chibi treatment. Sorry dude. I make it to Hearth Home City, where I can run around Amity Square with my Pokemon for a bit, and then there's a rival battle as I try to leave the city. Barry still hasn't evolved his Starly, so Tigris can come in without an Intimidate drop, and Waterfall takes out Starly, and Crunch takes out Weasel. Grottle is out next and is pretty beefy, but it also can't do much damage to us, so three Crunches take it out as he misses a Razor Leaf and just sets up a curse. Ponyta is last, but super effective Waterfall is overkill. On Route 209, I get access to the Good Rod, which means a few more encounters have opened up. Right on the same route, I fish myself a Goldeen, and backtrack a little bit to find a Barboach on Route 208. The new additions are interesting, but not immediately useful, as I jump into the fight with the Maylene a bit early due to her sharing the same level cap as the next gym. I led Ganges into Metatype, and use Water Pulse as she sets up a Light Screen. I use Calm Mind to offset the light screen as Metatite just uses Flash, but thankfully the next Water Pulse actually connects and takes it out. Machoke is up next, and a Psychic can't kill because of the light screen, and then it hits a crit low sweep, so I need to switch. 
I swap into Yang, who takes nearly half health from low sweep, and only does minimal damage with Water Pulse, as Knockoff almost takes her out. I bring out Tigress, which I probably should have done to begin with, and a Waterfall takes out Majoke. Lucario is up last, and I'm worried because I already used my Intimidate switch in on Machoke, but it just goes for Screech, as I do half health with a Waterfall. Lucario definitely outspeeds, so I swap into Tim's as a sack, but it just goes for Screech again. Tigress is back out, with 3 set defenses and the Intimidate attack drop, so he only takes a bit of damage from some resisted drain punches and finishes off Lucario after a couple more waterfalls. That's Maylene taken care of, but now there's an extra challenge because for some reason Crash Awake has the same level cap of 30 and I can't shut off the experience share item, so a lot of my Pokemon are approaching the cap. Thankfully, after dealing with some Team Galactic stuff with Dawn, I'm able to pick up some more encounters. A Wingle on Route 213, a Remoraid in Pastoria City itself, and a Wooper on Route 212 just after Pastoria City. The new recruits are pretty weak, but with a bit of grinding, both Murray the Wingle and Mississippi the Wooper evolve and can take out the gym trainers by themselves. With all the gym trainers out of the way, I can bring in the big guns for Wake, my rival water type user. I lead with Murray the Pelipper to set up the rain, and he can't learn thunder, but two shockwaves take out the opposing Gyarados. Quagsire with an electric immunity comes out, but I respond with Nile the Printplup, who can use four times effective Grass Knot to instantly take it out. Floatzel is out last, and manages to get the flinch with Bite on the first turn, but Nile successfully steals his Citrus Berry on the next. I swap into Tigress for the Intimidate and for some reason Gyarados can learn Thunder, so I risk the accuracy since the rain has already stopped, but it still lands, and that finishes off Wake pretty handily. As a fun side bonus, Young finally evolves into Gastrodon, who I'll be using as my Water Ground type instead of Mississippi the Quagsire. As I'm leaving the city to chase down a Galactic Grunt, Barry decides this is the perfect time to interrupt me for a battle, but his team is still exactly the same, so I'm just going to skip it. After the battle though, he does make a comment about how I should catch that Galactic Grunt who I was trying to chase down, and it's like, yeah man, I wonder why I couldn't catch him earlier. The Grunt does manage to escape past his guards at the lake, but as an awesome consolation prize, I get to say hi to Cynthia again. She gives me the medicine for the Psyduck, sorry Ganges, none for you, and I make it to Celestic Town where I can pick up the Surf TMs. Surf is kind of broken for a water type challenge, but I only get 5 TMs rather than a fully repeatable HM, so I actually have to be selective for once. I backtrack to Hearthome for Fantina, and I don't have a perfect response for her ghost types, but I've still got a plan. She leads with Driftlin, and I respond with Yang. A Strength Sap on the first turn lowers my attack, but Yang is a special attacker, so I'm not too concerned as I set up a substitute. She goes for Fly, and I miss my first Ancient Power, but that means I can immediately set up another Substitute after it gets broken on Impact. I use the alternating Fly turns to heal with Recover or set up Substitutes, and then use super effective Ancient Power when Driftblim lands. The second Ancient Power even gets me the Omni Boost, but Fantina uses a Hyper Potion so it still takes a while to take out Driftblim. After Driftblim is finally out of the picture, Gengar is out next, and it has Cursed Body instead of Levitate, so two super effective Bulldozes take it out. Miss Magius is up last, and unfortunately does have Levitate, so I swap into Tigress for a super effective Crunch, and to avoid 4 times effective Magical Leaf. Tigress gets hit with Confuse Ray, but his Person Berry shakes it off, and Crunch leaves Miss Magius with what looks like 1 HP, almost like it's got Sturdy. Fantina stalls with another potion, but on the next turn goes for a Dazzling Gleam rather than another Confuse Ray, so one more crunch finishes the job, and that's Fantina and the 5th Gym Badge taken care of. I head to Canalave City, and Barry's team is finally starting to show the signs of an actually competitive team. I lead Murray into his Staravia, so I can use two Shockwaves to ignore his double teams and disregard the attack drop from Intimidate. In Barry's Infinite Wisdom, Ponyta is next, and it uses Agility before a super effective Rain Boosted Surf wipes it off the face of the Earth. 
Weasel is next, but a Shockwave takes it out without an issue. Heracross is 4 times a week to flying, but Wing Attack only does half health since Pelipper is not a physical attacker. It uses Thief to steal and eat Murray's Orinberry, but two more Wing Attacks still finish the battle. Grottle is up last, but once again, I bring in Tigress to whittle it down with a few crunches and that finishes off Barry. I was actually really impressed with how well Murray was able to take down most of Barry's team, and if she just had a special flying type move, might have even been able to solo him. Rourke's dad, Byron, is up next with a steel type gym. And as I was tearing through his gym trainers, Nile evolved into my very own steel type, Empoleon. Byron seems unimpressed with the fact that I defeated his son, and wants to see for himself how strong I am. Tigress with Crunch is still my best answer to the partial Psychic Bronzor, and takes it out after 2 hits, but not before it can set up Trick Room, letting his slow steel types outpace me for 5 turns. Steelix is up next, and I need a special attacker to avoid dealing with his massive defense, so I swap into Yong, who can also ignore the incoming Thunderfang. Earthquake does a bit more than half of Yang's health, but her returning Surf nearly one-shots the Steelix, who holds on with Sturdy. Byron heals a couple of potions, but it just burns through the Trick Room turns, meaning that Yang can now outspeed again and take out the Steelix after a few more turns. Bastiodon is a blast, and has a bit more special defensive bulk than Steelix, but two Surfs are still able to take it out as it misses a Stone Edge. That's Byron taken care of, with only a bit more difficulty than his son. I meet up with the professor at the library, but before long, Team Galactic destroys one of the lakes, so I run around to fight Saturn and then Mars. The battles are mostly uneventful, but at one point while fighting Mars, Tigris heals itself of poison so I wouldn't worry. This is one of the few times the new friendship or affection mechanic starts to kick in, and part of me wishes I could turn it off to maintain a certain level of difficulty. Before I can check on the last of the three lakes, I need to make it through the snow north of Mount Coronet and deal with the 7th gym leader, Candace. She's got a bunch of ice types, and oddly enough, Gyarados and Octillery can both learn Flamethrower, so I've got a pretty strong answer for her Grass-Ice dual types. I'll also be able to ignore the chip damage from Hail using the Leftovers item that I stole from a bunch of Munchlax in the Grand Underground using Thief. I lead Volga into her Snover who sets up Hail with its Snow Warning ability, but a Flamethrower takes it out in one shot. A single Flamethrower is enough to deal with Sneasel as well, who just set up with Hone Claws, but now it's time for Metacham, who I don't have a great option for because of its coverage moves. We trade a Brick Break for a Flamethrower, but now that Volga is so low, I can't say for certain which move Metacham will go for. I decide to swap into Tigress for the Intimidate drop and thankfully she still goes for a resisted Brick Break rather than Rock Slide or Bulk Up. Rock Slide on the next turn doesn't do much damage, but does get the flinch chance. So all I get is some chip damage from Hail. Yang comes out next and resists the Rock Slide, and Hail has done enough damage that a single Surf takes it out on the next turn. Obama Snow is up next, and I'm worried it'll set up Aurora Veil or do big damage with Giga Drain but I've got a perfect response with Murray, who has the Drizzle ability to change the weather to rain and ruin her chances at setting up Aurora Veil. At this point, Obama Snow has limited offensive options, so I set up two stockpiles on Murray before she's able to land a Blizzard for decent damage. A Sky Plate boosted Pluck does decent damage, but more importantly steals her Citrus Berry for some recovery. The returning Blizzard does do quite a bit of damage still, so I swap into Nile. He resists the incoming blizzard and is able to take out Obama Snow with a super effective flash cannon, which is great because I was worried about a super effective earthquake. With the 7th gym out of the way, it's time for a lot of galactic plot stuff all at once. I catch up to Barry at Lake Acuity, and while he's having an existential crisis and vowing to become stronger for the sake of protecting suffering Pokemon, I'm busy admiring how photorealistic the water looks in the background. I mean, look at that. It's like a Pixar movie. Anyway, I make it through the Galactic HQ and fight Cyrus for the first time, which I'll skip over since we'll see him again soon. And then I fight Saturn in order to save the Lake Trio. The battle is nothing special aside from his Kadabra missing Kinesis, which I thought was pretty ironic. 
I make it to the Spear Pillar, where Cyrus is summoning Palkia and indulging himself in a monologue about nihilism that's undercut by the fact that he kinda looks like a Funko Pop. There's a quick double battle against Mars and Jupiter, where I team up with Barry and I spam Rain Boosted Surf to deal damage to their Bronzor and Barry's Munchlax. Sorry, dude. Their signature Skun Tank and Perugly are out next, and I've done so much damage to Munchlax that he gets taken out by one body slam. Again, sorry man. On the bright side, this means Star Raptor comes out next with an attack drop and decides to use close combat on the Pokemon that isn't weak to fighting type moves. As punishment, I use my last Surf PP to annihilate Star Raptor and do a bit more chip damage to Mars and Jupiter. Alright, I'm less sorry about that one, dude. I swap into Tigris for another Intimidate drop, and Barry is finally useful by using Brick Break to take out the screens that Bronzor set up and wipe out Perugly. After their aces are gone, it doesn't take much more to deal with their Golbat, although Barry does lose Heracross in the process. Alright, that one's on you, man. Time to face Cyrus, and he's shocked to find out that the Pokémon he used to trap Palkia would also have the power to release him. Hooray for Pokémon villain logic. I don't have the option to adjust my team before the battle, but I'm happy to lead Murray into his Honchkrow. Rain Boosted Surf does big damage and takes out Honchkrow in two hits, as it just uses Deep Fog to lower my evasiveness. Gyarados is next, but Murray is my go-to counter anyways, so I use Pluck to get rid of the Wakan Berry, arguably unnecessary, and then use Shockwave for big damage. Unfortunately, Gyarados lands a crit waterfall while the rain is still up, and because it outspeeds Murray, I need to switch. Yong comes out to tank a Crunch, which unfortunately crits again, but after getting hit with an Earthquake on the next turn, I use super effective Ancient Power and get the Omni Boost. Weevil is next, and luckily I go for Recover as it uses Dig. Yong takes a bit of damage from the Dig and retaliates with super effective Ancient Power for more than half health. Weevil uses Dig again. And I kind of hoped Earth Power would work like Earthquake and still land, but that's not how it works. But Ancient Power on the next turn is all it takes. The Emotionless Cyrus has a Crobat as his ace, which means either the game devs think that a Stoic Nihilist would have the emotional capacity to be attached to his Pokémon, or Cyrus is actually a hypocrite and may not even realize it. Regardless, it can barely touch Yang, and two more Ancient Powers take him out. Palkia is still hanging out at the peak, and it is a water type, so I use a Master Ball and shove him into a box to wrap up the storyline. Speaking of water types though, the 8th gym leader Volkner is an electric type user, which on paper sounds like a terrifying ordeal for a water type challenge, but I've got three water ground types to choose from, so I'm not worried. I also realized that Mississippi the Quagsire has water absorb, which means it's immune to all of Raichu's attacks. I was curious if the AI would have the capacity to swap out upon realizing this, but it just stays in with Raichu, so I can cheese it out with a Pokémon that is 10 levels weaker, and even burn one of his full restores. Ambipom is up next, so I switch into Tigris and lower his attack to compensate for the extra technician damage. I immediately swap into Yang to avoid the Thunderbolt, and I decide to try and fish for an Ancient Power Omni Boost since that's worked for me in the past, but no luck. Ambipom now has access to Last Resort, so I stall out the PP with Recover as I weave in more Ancient Powers. Eventually, I do take it out, and on the final Ancient Power, I get the Omni Boost. Volkner sends out Octillery, but it doesn't have Bullet Seed, so I stay in and heal with Recover. He goes for Octazooka to do a bit of damage, but Yang's Earth Powers are much stronger and take it out after a few cycles. All that's left is Luxray, and it doesn't stand a chance. One more Earth Power takes out Volkner, and that's all 8 Gym Badges taken care of. I pick up the Waterfall TMs from Jasmine, who's visiting from Johto, and I always like it when characters travel between games and regions, it makes the series feel more connected and I am in no way biased by the fact that Jasmine is one of my favorite gym leaders. 
I head to Victory Road, which is shockingly easy compared to some of the scarier trainers I faced in the Hoenn remakes, and before long I arrive at the Pokemon League. There's actually a massive jump in the level cap between the Gym Leaders and the Elite Four, so I took the time to readjust my party before facing Barry for the last time. I trained everyone up to level 60, not realizing that Barry caps out at 55, which I feel kinda bad about because his team is actually kinda terrifying now. He's got competitive items and everything. I lead Murray into Staraptor, since he can't really do much damage to begin with, and I set up three stockpiles while staying relatively healthy with leftovers. Ice Bream breaks Staraptor's Focus Dash, and a Surf on the next turn finishes it off. At this point, Murray goes on a killing spree, as a combination of Hurricane, Ice Beam, and Surf tear through most of Barry's teams. Murray gets outsped a couple of times, but even super effective Rock Slide from Heracross doesn't do much damage. Barry's last Pokemon is Snorlax, and I know it has Covet, so I try to be clever and switch into Yang, who has the Sticky Hold ability to prevent it from stealing the leftovers item. That being said, Yang can't do much damage to Snorlax, and after being put to sleep with Yawn, she eats a lot of damage for free before I cave in and decide to switch. I rotate to Tigris for the Intimidate drop, and to avoid high horsepower, and then swap to Han the Tentacool, thinking I'll try poisoning it with Sludge Wave. Then I realize I'll probably just get taken out with high horsepower the next turn, so I swap back into Tigris for another Intimidate drop. I cycle back and forth for a while to get more Intimidates off, but honestly, I think I just wasn't sure what to do until I finally realized that Azumarill has a fighting type move that I saved specifically for reasons like this. Snorlax does end up using Covet to steal Ryan's leftovers, but Superpower gets the one shot, so all that switching was kind of pointless. Sometimes the most straightforward solution really is the best one. Also, as a random tangent, while I was grinding up the last few levels to the cap, I ran into a shiny Machoke in the Grand Underground. I'm pretty sure this is the first genuine shiny I've ever run into, and I can't even use it. No Masuda method, no chain fishing, no shiny charm, none of that. I had to catch it, purely for the novelty of it, and then I traded it in the first union room I walked into. I hope they enjoy their shiny Machamp. But with that tangent out of the way, here's my team of 6 water types, leveled up to match Lucian's Bronzong. Pretty diverse in terms of secondary typings, but let's see how well I can do against the new Elite Four with their updated movesets and items. First up is Aaron, the bug type trainer. And I'm not overly worried because his highest level Pokemon is only 57, but I still shouldn't let my guard down. Murray is up first to set up the rain, giving Hurricane perfect accuracy in order to sweep most of Aaron's team. All of his actual bug types get taken out by Hurricane, but then I swap to Yang once his ace, Drapion, comes out. Yang takes a Cross Poison on the switch, and then a Night Slash, but Soft Sand boosted Earth Power wipes out Drapion, and that's Elite Four, number one. Next is Bertha with her ground types, who on paper sounds like an easy victory, but while planning this battle, I was surprised when I realized that two of my Pokemon were actually weak to ground type moves because of the Steel and Poison dual typings. Her Quagsire is up first, this water typing helps reduce the impact of my water type moves, but makes it extremely vulnerable to Grass Knot. Ryan's Grass Knot one shots Quagsire and uses up Whiskash's Rindo Berry, prompting me to swap into Han to tank what would have been a devastating Belch. Han heals to full on the next turn with a Giga Drain, but again, his poison typing makes him vulnerable to all of Bertha's earthquakes, so I swap into Tigris for the ground immunity and then into Yang to tank the Stone Edge. I start with Ancient Power to deal with Golem Sturdy, and fish for a lucky Omni Boost that I don't get, and then a couple of recovers get me back to full health before a Surf takes out Golem. I was surprised to find that Yang outspeeds a Pseudo Wudo, so I waste a turn on Recover before getting the one shot with Surf. Hippowdon is last, but Yang's ground typing means she's not concerned with the Sandstorm, and a couple of Surfs can take down Bertha after she stalls with a couple of full restores. Now it's Flint, the fire type user who doesn't have many fire types. It's the Sinnoh region, he's doing his best. It sounds like it should be another straightforward battle, but he's got some interesting coverage moves. 
is Rabidash has a wide lens and hypnosis, so I gave Han a Chesto Berry just in case, but it misses anyway. Han Surf leaves Rabidash with a sliver, which baits out a full restore from Flint as a high roll on the next Surf takes it out. Steelix is next, but it doesn't have super effective Earthquake, so I stay in and end up taking it out with another Surf. Low Punny is next, and I don't think it'll be able to do much damage to begin with, so I set up Acid Armor and luckily avoid the Miracle. I set up all the way to plus 6, as Low Punny does barely any damage, and then I use Giga Drain to heal and also to avoid any big hits from Miracle. I chip away at Low Punny's health with this strategy but I overestimated Han's Surf damage, and Lil Bunny barely lives, letting it get off a Mirror Coat that takes out Han. First death of the Elite Four, and completely avoidable if I had just kept playing it slow. Young switches in, and tanks high jump kick well, before getting the revenge kill with Ancient Power. I keep using Ancient Power on Driftblim, unbothered by the burn from Will-O-Wisp, but once Driftblim uses Minimize, I realize it's probably trying to Baton Pass to Infernape. I swap into Murray to secure the kill with Shockwave before it can get off any more minimizes, but it's too late. Driftblim uses Badon Pass, and now I've got to deal with an evasive monkey. I swap into Yang to ignore Thunder Punch before switching into Tigress for the Intimidate. At this point, I start a very purposeful set of switches to keep lowering Infernape's attack, as Yang is unaffected by Thunder Punch, and Tigress doesn't take much damage from fighting type moves. This also has the extra benefit of wasting Infernape's close combat PP and lowering his defense and special defense in the process. It takes a while, but I want to avoid the mistake that lost me Han just before, so when I'm finally satisfied that Tigers can tank a 4 times effective Thunder Punch, I stay in and break the Focus Sash using Waterfall. I expected Flint to heal, but he gets more damage with Thunder Punch as I miss a Waterfall thanks to Minimize. The third Waterfall gets the kill, but Tigers is super low. That being said, Driftblim has literally no attacking moves, so an Ice Fang connects through the Minimize, and Flint has been successfully defeated with an unfortunate sacrifice. Lucian is the last Elite Four member, and I don't have a perfect answer for his Psychic types, so it's time for Brute Force. I send Niall to deal with the Fairy type Mr. Mime, but he gets off a Light Screen first. Flash Cannon then does barely any damage between the Filter ability, which lowers super effective damage, and a light screen, but Mr. Mime also can't do much damage to Nile. I keep using Flash Cannon, partly hoping for a special defense drop, and partly to just wait out the light clay boosted screen turns, and we successfully bait out a full restore from Lucian. I eventually take out Mr. Mime, but Leftovers wasn't enough to keep Nile that healthy after like 6 turns of attacks, and a pure power metacham with a muscle band is next. I'm not sure if it'll go for high jump kick or thunder punch, both would have been super effective, so I play it safe and switch to Yang rather than Tigress. I wanted the early attack drop from Intimidate, but thankfully I chose right, because Metacham opts for the non-stab Thunder Punch for some reason, and that probably would have killed Tigress. It's time for some more Intimidate switching, and at one point the affection mechanic kicks in to get me a free dodge with Tigress. This means Metacham takes half health from recoil, but I'm a completionist and a stubborn stick in the mud when it comes to some of the later mechanical additions in the Pokemon series, so I keep up with the Intimidate swaps. Once my stubbornness subsides, I outspeed and get the kill with Yang Surf, and now I've got to deal with Magic Guard Alakazam with a Life Orb. Like seriously, that's right out of a competitive set or something. I want to rush down Alakazam before it can set up with Nasty Plot, and thankfully two Surfs do the trick, but not before it sets up a future site that now I have to have anxiety about. Yang is pretty bulky and immune to Girafferig's Thunderbolt, so I stay in and fish for more Omni Boosts with Ancient Power. Unfortunately, I have no luck with that and even get hit with a Crit Psychic on the same turn as the Future Sight. Yang survives because she was at full health, but now it's definitely time to switch. Ryan comes out to tank a Psychic pretty well and even a Thunderbolt on the next turn while hitting hard with Waterfall. It's risky, but Ryan is able to tank even the next Thunderbolt with only 14 HP and gets the kill with another Waterfall. My team is in rough shape as Bronzong comes out, and I thought Bronzong would go for super effective Gyro Ball, but Ryan was so low that I send Nile into a super effective Earthquake. 
Niall lives on 1 HP, so I won't feel sad, and I've got mixed feelings about being saved by a mechanic I was complaining about two seconds ago. The AI's odd decision comes back again, and instead of using Earthquake, opts for Payback as I switch into Tigris. I get chip damage with my own Payback, but Tigris was pretty low to begin with, so I swap into Murray as Bronzong sets up a Trick Room. This actually works in my favor, because now Payback won't get the bonus damage from being hit, so Bronzong can't do much damage to Murray as I take it out with two Rain Boosted Surfs. That's the Elite Four taken care of with only one death, but man, Lucian really made me work for that last battle. And now it's time for the moment we've all been waiting for, the champion battle with Cynthia, which was terrifying enough even before the updated movesets and items. Her team has bulk, power, and speed with some really interesting and rare Pokemon, but I think I've got enough of a strategy to deal with even her Garchomp. I will say at the beginning that I meant to use rare candies to level up Tigris to 66 to match Garchomp, but I misclicked and got him to 67. One level over isn't a huge deal, but I thought I'd point it out. I'm as prepared as I'll ever be, and I send out Ryan the Azumarill to deal with Spirit Tomb, which actually has a weakness to Fairy in this generation, as opposed to the absolute wall that it was in Generation 4. The first play rough leaves it in the red, and triggers its Citrus Berry, but after tanking a Shadow Ball, one more play rough takes it out. Cynthia sends out Roserade. So I swap into Nile, knowing it'll either go for super effective Energy Ball or Sludge Bomb. And thankfully, she opted for Sludge Bomb that doesn't affect the Steel type. The Energy Ball comes out on the next turn, and unfortunately hits really hard with a crit, as Nile responds with a Drill Peck. I was trying to remember the damage calculation and decide to risk it, so Nile lives with 4 HP and finishes Roserade with one more Drill Peck. Gastrodon is up next with super effective Earthquake but I decide to stay in for some damage with 4 times effective Grass Knot, and Nile even gets a crit, but it's not enough to take down Gastrodon. Nile gets hit with a Scald, but lives thanks to the affection mechanic for the second time. I definitely wasn't planning on that, but it allows Nile to outspeed and get the kill with another Grass Knot. Lucario is out, and just like Alakazam, I'm hoping to get rid of it before Nasty Plots come into play. Nile stays in for the safe switch, and Cynthia takes out my starter with a Dragon Pulse. This allows Ryan to come out safely, and he tanks a super effective flash cannon like an absolute lad, retaliating with huge power boosted superpower for the kill. My low tick is next, and here's where the battle gets weird. My low tick has a flame orb to trigger her Marvel Scale ability, granting her extra defense and preventing me from using Toxic, even if I had a Pokemon that could learn it. Tentacruel for some reason can't learn it by the way. Ryan is my only surviving Pokemon who could learn a grass type move, so I decide to stay in for some grass knot damage, but it only does a quarter damage each time, and Ryan goes down a couple of turns later. Rest in peace. I need Tigris healthy for Garchomp, and with the plus defense from Marvel Scale, I'm sure he'll take a decent chunk of damage before he can take down Milotic. My alternative is Murray, and it may not have been the best idea to set up Rain for Milotic's Scald damage, but I reasoned that she resists water moves anyway. I'm hoping the Hurricane damage in conjunction with Burn will be enough to take down Milotic, but she keeps using Recover even after getting the Confusion Chance from Hurricane. Ice Beam does a bunch of damage, and even worse, Murray is frozen. I hoped the Confusion Chance would buy me enough time to thaw out and heal from leftovers, but no such luck. I decide I'll need to rely on Yang to take down Milotic, so I stay in with Murray to stall out the rain, and our magnificent pelican goes down to some more ice beams. Milotic has managed to balance out the odds, and now it's two Pokemon versus two Pokemon. Yang and Milotic can barely damage each other, and both have recover. So what comes next was literally 10 solid minutes of me fishing for Omni Boosts from Ancient Power and Special Defense Drops from Earth Power but I must have used up all my luck earlier because I didn't get anything. I filmed this footage at like 3 in the morning and I couldn't even use emulator speed up, so this was a particularly grueling fight. But eventually, Yang got through all of my Lotix recovery PP and finally took down the Great Beast that destroyed half of my team. Cynthia's ace, Garchomp, is up last, and compared to my Lotic, I'm not even worried. 
Garchomp is fast and powerful, but its Yachi Berry can only save it from one 4 times effective Ice-type move. I go to Sock Yang for the save switch, but it survives the Earthquake so that I wouldn't feel sad, and does decent damage with Ice Beam even after using up the Yachi Berry. Murray must have been watching over us for her revenge, because the Ice Beam also freezes Garchomp solid. I take the chance now to swap into Tigris. Tigris at full health would have been strong enough to take down a couple of hits from Garchomp and get the kill with Avalanche, but now I don't even need to rely on that as a single Avalanche defeats the weakened Garchomp and I've managed to beat Cynthia. This was a crazy challenge, and my team ended up in tatters, but I am super happy to say that I managed to succeed in my first attempt at a monotype challenge, using only water types to clear a hardcore Nuzlocke of Shining Pearl. The single type restriction was difficult to maneuver around in the early game, but like I expected, the variety of water types in Sinnoh made it manageable. Overall, I'm pretty happy with the Gen 4 Remix. I'm definitely guilty of a certain degree of nostalgia goggles, but Shining Pearl definitely felt like a great way to revisit the Sinnoh region with some updated features. The permanent experience share was kinda annoying, but definitely added an extra layer of difficulty for a hardcore Nuzlocke with overleveling rules. I also mentioned it a few times, but the new affection mechanic adds more RNG for the benefit of the player, which can be a bit of a get out of jail free card but perhaps that's balanced by the fact that some of the Gym Leaders and Elite Four get competitive level items while I just stuck a Leftovers on everybody. This run was a lot of fun, and I've got some more ideas to try with Shining Pearl, so if you've made it this far into the video, I hope you stick around to see what I've got coming next. But once again, it's the river here, and thank you all so much for watching.